Thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, I welcome you. I'm really glad to be here. First, about the title Frozen Modernity. It's uh, like naming your talk. Uh, when you think that you are being really creative and name him, I don't know, Sausage. And then you go out to the fields and you hear Sausage, Sausage, and it's not you, then you know that it's ah. So please remember, it's not hot modern, it's frozen modernity. Uh, okay. When I started studying shell architecture, what struck me was the stunning similarities um, in development, form, and application all around the Western world. The little parallel universes, all with unique features, but still the same problems and almost the same answers. There are some of the most significant people uh, when it comes to Hungarian shell architecture. Not all of them are Hungarian. Uh, I truly believe that without the context, you lose at least half the truth. That is why I feel it is important to talk about the work of Nervi or Candela and others uh, when we talk about Hungarian shell architecture. Since we are here to talk about utopias and realities, I would like to show you a little part of the harsh realities of this research. I am lifting the curtain. All of these guys are dead. Uh, why do I say that? I have a funny explanation I'm happy to tell you later, and I have a serious one. Live people are trouble. After the careful studying of the contemporary publications, I arrived at the conclusion, to my surprise to some extent, that the mid-20th century Hungary was not shut off from the architectural world of the Western, of at least Western Europe. Most great international pieces of architecture had been published uh, quite quickly, and that was especially true for shells. We know that, for example, Pia Lulzi Nervi was an idol. One of the first books in Hungarian on modernist architecture was dedicated uh, to his works in the 60s. He was present in much of the university lectures. He was the tsumtor of his time. But then again, we saw that it would be great to get some feedback on this and many other topics from people who actually took part in designing shahs, since we are so lucky that they are still with us. And we started to make interviews. I have to admit in advance that I'm really, really bad at that. We were sitting there, starry-eyed, and asked the question. Could you name an architect or an engineer whose work had a great impact on you, or better still, did you have any contact to the international community of shell builders? And they answered, absolutely none. Um, first, I thought, never you mind. My first interviewee was Arpad Varga, a great engineer, uh, who worked for Uvatar, a state-owned design office, and knew mostly the people involved in the scientific community could get hold of Western publications, so I said, no problem. It did rock my theory, but it did not destroy it. But then I interviewed two people deeply involved with both fields, uh, but the answer was pretty much the same. Uh, it was, as my fellow lecturer, Levante Sabo, would say, checkmate. And then, uh, Lajos Kollár, uh, one of the greatest engineers of his time, saved me. He was a really strange sort of engineer, wrote a book together with an architect and to top it about aesthetics. He was responsible for the plans of the new sports arena of Budapest. Uh, they won the competition, the design competition, in 1960, 1967, so naturally the building uh, was never realized. But it is still, in my opinion, one of the greatest achievements of Hungarian shell architecture. Its triangular form is the one that best suited this site, which is also a triangle. Uh, and since it's, it has really great spans, the shell was quite a natural uh, choice. I said shells, however, basically it was a steel frame structure, but it worked principally as a shell. We found the original version of a lecture he gave on, on this building, where he lists all the buildings that inspire the plan or can serve as a useful analogy. That was a relief. First of all, he cited the Cyan ET in Perry. Uh, it's a hollow two-layer shell. It's the biggest shell on the world. It spans like two, more than 200 meters. It was designed by Nicholas Eskinen and August Perry. Um, he also named the Palazzo dello Sport in Rome, uh, which was built for the Olympics in 1960. 
It's designed by Pierluigi Nervi and Annibale Vitaluzzi, and I will come back to this building a bit later. So what I learned from this interviewing experience is, of course, to never do it again, uh, but it was an, inter an important lesson, because I do think that context is important and we can be more conscious in both design and analysis if we are aware of it, but nobody, uh, but not everybody shares this enthusiasm of context. Some great design can happen completely unaware, consciously of the analogies, but it does not mean that they do not exist. Uh, to keep some structure in this lecture, I chose periodization, which is a cheap choice, but nevertheless, uh, what does it all have to do with Olympics? I think it's a useful guidance in the periodization, especially for sports gigs, because of two dates. If the 1960 uh, Summer Olympics put the shells on the map, the 1968 Games killed it. How? This is a picture from the Roman Olympics in 1960. Uh, the building behind Cassius Clay, he was uh, the winner of boxing, is the Palazzo dello Sport. It was also designed by Nervi. It's the, sort of the bigger sister of the Palazzetto del Sport I was uh, showing a picture a little bit earlier about. Um, and this Olympics, the 1960 was the first Olympics aired all over the world. Uh, so it made not only the athletes, but also the buildings really, really famous, and by, by extension, shells. Shells have been around for at least 30 years by then, a mostly industrial application, but let's be honest, no normal people would care for a lovely regular factory building, no matter how skillfully the roof is uh, constructed. However, people do have a thing for the extraordinary, like the pyramids still an item after thousands of years, or nervous shells in this case. So shells were on. It was 1960. Then happened Japan, the Tokyo Olympics, some great buildings there as well. And then here we are in Mexico City in 1968. Uh, the building here does not matter, it's not a shell, but the people does. They look happy, or at least happy to be noticed. The people of Mexico, like many after them, use the publicity of the Olympics to raise important questions like wages. The government was forced to introduce the minimum wage system after the Olympics, and that literally killed shells. In Mexico, definitely, but the same happened all over the world around the same time. Uh, so it symbolically was the end of shell buildings. Why? Shells are the perfect manifestation of the classical modernist idea of the symbiotic relationship between form and structure. That's the romantic side of the story, as far as an engineer would go. And at least shells were considered economical since they were reducing material waste. Frey Otto, uh, a fantastic visionary architect, put it really nice. After living through the years of devastation after World War II, he insisted throughout his professional life on finding solutions, no matter how difficult it was to actually work it out, as long as it was humanly possible, that would reduce material waste. Shells did exactly that. But they were hard to design and even harder to build. The low cost of workforce was the key for shells to be built. This is how shell building looks like on the designer's table. But this is the reality, and this, and this. A lot of dirt, a lot of people, few machines. A lot of climbing up and down the formwork with buckets of concrete. The first two pictures uh, showed the salt warehouse in Kazins Bartzika. I will come back to it later. It's a building from the 50s. And the last one, this one, is an experimental shell structure from uh, Kandela. It's also from the 50s, the same period. Shell building is a hard task. Even prefabrication uh, could not change that. The Cousins Bartica building was actually uh, prefabricated, but it was done on site. Uh, it was a bit better, but could not change the need for cheap workforce. And so it was doomed for four. It's a bit more complex uh, picture of uh, periodization of shell structures. The denser and the darker are the dots, the more shells were built. The heyday was really after the World War II, uh, until the 70s. Uh, the basics of the theoretical background was developed by the, by the end of World War uh, II. Uh, shells were built, however, as you can see, from 
as you can see, more or less, <laughs> from, <laughs> from the 20s on. Uh, the pioneers were probably uh, the German engineers like uh, Dischinger and Finsterwalder and also uh, the French engineers like Eugen Freisini or Bernard Lefay. Uh, but then there was a boom in shell building and from the 30s on everybody built shells. Like uh, Eduardo Toroya, uh, Nervi in Italy and our own Istvan Menhat. He was a Hungarian uh, engineer. Um, and uh, his role cannot be overemphasized because he was the, the first shell builder uh, in Hungary and some would argue he was the best. Um, the heyday, uh, an example on how usual the, he the shells were, for example in Hungary, there is literally no part of the country where the main city of the area does not have a shell covered bus station or, sta or train station. So no some notorious people like Heinz Ischler, two names I have not mentioned before, or Frey Otto, uh, they did shells uh, even after the 70s. Um, Frey Otto, I assume everybody knows. Heinz Ischler is probably uh, less well known. He was Swiss, so I basically uh, told you everything to say. But uh, let's just uh, put it this way, he put, built thousands of shells. He did his own language, uh, I, I mean he created his own language. I will show some example of his work. It's really, really extraordinary. So he was the only one who could do it longer. So let's go to the beginning, from the 20s to the uh, World War II. I have a couple of, exam a couple of international examples uh, on this slide. Uh, for you, it's top left. Uh, it's a really early example from uh, Tallinn. Uh, it was uh, just recently renovated and it's done by a Danish company. They're not really famous for shells, but it's a huge construction and it's one of the first shells ever to be built. Then uh, bottom left is a building from Eduardo Antoroja. Uh, top right is actually in Budapest. It's the Nagy Vásárcsarnok at Csepel but it was built uh, by a German company. Uh, bottom right is a building, or better still, a model from Nervi. A shell building uh, required a pioneering spirit. It has never been done before. Uh, the picture here is taken out of a Hungarian publication of the period, and it is titled The Boldness of the Structure Engineer. It says really it all. Uh, it, it really says it all. So about approaches and schools. Due to its complexity, shell building was, the, uh, was for the boldest of them all. Therefore, even though there are some national characteristics, those are deeply influenced by the work of a couple of outstanding designers, both national and international. Nevertheless, there are two distinct approaches, and it's noteworthy to see how those relate to the national trends and or the personal preferences. Uh, these pictures are for the Facebook generation, strong visual impact, short text, clear message. They illustrate the main difference of the two methods. Either you use intuition uh, and feel the force, or you must, to a great extent, crunch numbers. Usually, actually, you have to do both, but the ratio might vary. To your left is uh, the engineering analysis, which is based on mathematical models, and to the right is form finding intuition which is based on actual model building. And the uh, architects and engineers listed here as they belong either to one or the other group. Um, you might say that uh, the Hungarian school was really, really uh, more an engineering and had more an engineering and analytical uh, approach. Uh, it closely linked to the German schools and both are very, very theoretical. The German DVD company I mentioned earlier, at least I showed earlier, built some of the earliest reinforced concrete shells in Hungary, as the Nagy Vásárcsarnok at Csepel and a salt warehouse at Pétfürdő. But when it comes to methodology, it is also important to note that the education of the engineers in Hungary uh, was quite similar to those of the, en of the engineers in Germany since of the somewhat common Austro, uh, since the Austro-Hungarian monarchy um, meant that they had somewhat common system of education. On the other side of the table, you might notice the name of Heinz Ischler. He was a completely different school, built a lot of models, and basically worked out of those. 
just to contradict myself, uh, it's an example of an actual built model from the notoriously theoretical Hungarian school. It's the roof of the caffeine factory, uh, which goes under load testing here. Uh, it's a fact that actually all shell builders build models, because uh, theory was fine, but for instance, without the computers, you could not possibly calculate the, the uh, real forces. It's another uh, model, probably on another level. It's Frey Otto's uh, Stuttgarter Bahnhof. It's actually from uh, the 1997. It was a competition model. So do we have the same problems and the same answers all over the way, all over the world? Uh, my first example from this early period, which is finally a Hungarian example, is the booth garage at Kenenfeld. Uh, it's uh, designed by Istvan Menhard. It's one of my favorite examples because it has so many uh, qualities. First, it is a bus, bus garage. By definition, a building that cries for a shell. The rapid motorization and industrialization at the beginning of the 20th century required more open floor plans and lesser supports and greater spans. Shells were best suited. This shell spans 86 meters in the transverse direction with only six centimeter of thickness. It was the largest of its kind at the time of its creation, which was in 1941, all over the world. Uh, and then it's the Marinian hangars designed by Nicolas Esquilan and August Perry. It bears striking similarities, but it was bought, built more than 10 years later. Actually, it is 100 meters span each, since there are two of them. Uh, the elements are prefabricated. Uh, it's, as it's assembled on the ground and lifted to 19 meters, but they had more time to practice. It's also building by uh, Istvan Menhard. Uh, it's the first, it was one of the uh, first hyper shells uh, he built. Uh, hyper shells are special because uh, they have double curvature uh, with all the positive consequences structurally, but they can be formed by straight lines, uh, which is a huge, huge advantage if you think about scaffolding. The first publication addressing the theory of hypershells was, was written by two French engineers, Aymond and Lafay, at the beginning of the 30s, uh, but they did not build any by then. Mein had read the article and built these shells. He was one of the first who has ever done it. I would have said he was the first, but then, like a week ago, I read that uh, an Italian engineer, Baroni, did the same around the same time, so now I, I really can say that. But Candela, who was rightly famous for hypers, uh, actually built his first structures like 15 years later than Manhattan did. It's a more advanced Hungarian example for the same typology. It's completely prefabricated. It's a bus garage again, hooray. Uh, but it's, it's designed by Arpad Varga, my beloved uh, interviewee. Uh, here we are at the heyday. Uh, most examples I have already shown. Uh, Top left is the Palazzetto dello Sport by Nervi. Uh, top right is the CNET in Paris. Uh, uh, bottom left is the Hyper from Candela. And bottom right is a structure from Ischler, actually. So please note how much it is different from the others. It's really slender, but it's really expressive. <coughs> okay. okay. Imitation and adaptation. So many analogies. How is it then? Is it imitation or is it adaptation? I have a really exciting uh, citation from Josef Perikan, a professor of structures and an advocate for shells. I will not read it. I will read only the uh, bold part. Uh, interestingly, a structure that defines a new trend is always based on an idea of a more efficient solution. But any trend has followers. The first type of followers end up imitating by trying to avoid it, while the others take pleasure in following a good lead, and by doing so, end up creating something new. My first example from this period is uh, the Salt Warehouse in Kostinsbartica, about which I have shown some construction pictures before. And prefabrication is actually an exciting topic uh, in the lights of this citation above, because um, Nervi was an advocate of prefabrication worldwide, and he was much admired for his attitude in Hungary. 
uh, prefabrication has a special uh, place in this uh, whole social political context of the country. Um, and all of Nervi's uh, outspoke about uh, prefabrication was praised and quickly reprinted in Hungarian. Uh, and they really uh, got quite uh, and they really got quite advanced in this technique. So I s might say that it is worse to, that it's okay to say that it was more an adaptation in case of prefabrication than in any other field when it comes to the uh, analogies of Hungarian and international examples. <coughs> so Kazin's Vartika, it was largely prefabricated. It was designed by Miklós Gnédig at Ipartev. Uh, two analogies. One is a software house by Nervi, uh, bottom right. The top one is actually Petfürder, it's Hungary. Uh, it was built in the 30s. Uh, and it is, again, a design by the German company DVDAG. The main reason of this, uh, the main uh, message of these three pictures is that it was a really strong typology. All software houses all over the world looked exactly the same. Uh, this is another project, a bit later project from Miklós Gnédig. What I wanted to show you is that he adapted this uh, unique feature of the Nervian logic, which was the ferrot cement uh, permanent formwork in the form of rhombus, and he took it and adapted it to this unique situation where we had, when he had to uh, change the roof of a factory in Budapest. This is a later example, a more, uh, and it relates to the Nervian system, but in a different way. Uh, it's a bus garage again. It's designed by Arpad Varga in uh, 1962. Um, it's, it's called the Oikos system, which is based on the Zollinger system. Uh, it was originally uh, sold for uh, wooden construction. It works with short, prefabricated uh, concrete elements in this case, and uh, puts them together on an incomplete scaffolding, which is uh, sort of economical. But the result is quite similar to what we have seen in Nervi. Since we are in Germany, I wanted to bring you um, a German analogy, which is quite strong, I would say. It's a Fermi terminal at uh, Santo, designed by Dejou de Trend, Janusz in 1967. And it's the Messehalle Rostov Shutov, designed by Ulrich Mütter. Uh, it's designed in 1966. And the late period. Uh, for example, uh, not uh, by accident, the top left is by Ischler, the top right is by uh, Frei Otto. Um, the bottom uh, left is actually by Nervi, but it's his late period when he exported his knowledge to the United States. They still had the money, but it was no longer economical at all. And to the right, it's uh, Stefan Polony's building. He was, he claims his staff, a follower of the Hungarian school. That's why I included his picture. This is one of my uh, favorite examples of this period. I have a lot of favorites. Um, it's Villanyang uh, to has by Yenny Fizi built in 1971. Uh, it's not exclusively due to its current inhabitants, uh, the pelicans, but it definitely adds to the uh, beauty of the structure now. It's a ground voltage structure, uh, which was built for the adventure, adventure Park in Budapest. No speculation is needed. Fusi unveils himself a famous precursor, and it is the Losman and Tianes by Candela, um, bottom left. In an article uh, describing the structure, he makes reference to two of his previous publications, and one is actually dealing with the system of, of um, Candela's work. The another reference on this picture is the Royal Marche Hall, uh, designed by Bernard Lefay. It's roughly the same time as the Candela building. It's both built in the 50s. The Hungarian uh, analogy is in the 70s. The Royal Marche Hall is actually bigger and thinner than both of these other two, so he wins. But all three is really fantastic structures. Um, as a um, parting gift, uh, it's two extraordinary pictures from the best at Mishko Stapolca. It was designed by uh, Andreas Ruffa, and uh, he had a great aid at Dula Markus. Andreas Ruffa was the architect, and Dula Markus the engineer. It's completely different than I have ever seen in Hungarian shell architecture. He was employed at Mayeptav, 
which was a company building infrastructure, basically. So it was not a place for an architect. It meant he was somewhat different, too different from the mainstream that they shoved him to Manifter. But his colleagues really admired him because he had a unique view of, of uh, architecture and did some amazing shots. They are usually uh, found in passes, but in various places on the country. And he had also some um, water towers. Uh, the closing remark is two pictures as the architect of the period, uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi, accompanied by Le Corbusier, a shell builder of the Western world and a shell builder of Hungary, Gnedig Miklos, a lone wolf. I would like to take the opportunity to welcome you all to our opening exhibition, which opens next week. It's in Budapest, but it's a beautiful city. <laughs> uh, and it opens on the 5th. Uh, at uh, 6.30, so I hope to see some of you there. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that was quite interesting. Perhaps you didn't mention that uh, for scaffolding they used a lot of materials and yes. a lot of manpower, so, and, yes. and that, that was a... Uh, great uh, disadvantage of this story. I didn't hear that approach. Do we have questions? <laughs> well, <laughs> perhaps to technical issue. What about shells in other socialist countries? He has a question why it should be uh, helpful to choose such a construction with, uh, which uh, secures material because uh, we several times talked about uh, socialist economy as a co uh, economy of uh, of poverty. Uh, I'm not sure if it is a poverty of concrete, but it was a poverty of steel in any case. And these shells you showed, as the main uh, material to to be spared, uh, is the steel. Is it not only the centimeters of concrete, but the steel? Uh, on the other hand, people like uh, Fry Otto, for instance, uh, he did this invention in capitalist country with no problem of poverty, but uh, ecology. See. Uh, the step was the ecolo uh, ecologic way. Uh, is there an idea to compare these two uh, ways of thinking rational? Be, uh, be aware of wasting steel or uh, f because you are poor or you are ecologic on the way? Yeah. Mm. Somewhat differing approaches, but another level they are not, since maybe my interpretation of Freyoto's original thought is not complete, but I felt that this desire, which was of course then later uh, labeled ecological since Germany went on luckily uh, uh, fruitful development after World War II and Hungary not so quickly, but um, at the beginning uh, his intention was quite the same as his, uh, his Eastern contemporaries because nobody has, had any material, and nobody had any money, and nobody had any skilled workforce. Um, and I think this, this experience uh, was what originally um, inspired him. And later it changed, of course, to this ecological thinking, but that was more of a consequence. Is it an answer to your question, or? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyhow, I think that that this topic fits absolutely to the to the title utopies and and realities, because because there are ideal approaches, and and uh, somehow it has to go to go through the practice to the to the real world. And any other questions? <clears throat> Uh, the answer to Wolfgang's question, what's the difference between ecological and poor, is always uh, innovation, which was missing 
quite a few times in social countries or it was forbidden to have innovation in a certain way. So in order to be ecological, you need to innovate. You really have to reinvent yourself and for some reason it was not not a thing in social countries. They, they thought that uh, if something worked once, it will work for quite a long time. And that's, that's why, for example, the automobile industry was <laughs> like that. They produced the same car for 20, 30 years. And it was because they didn't want to innovate. I don't really um, feel that it was intended as a question, but I would still strongly oppose, because I do think that socialist countries had innovation, indeed, in many fields. So, and it was not banned, per se. The nature of innovation was a bit different, but... The innovation of uh, engineers and architects was there, but not from the decision makers. <laughs> uh, I think... Um, but okay, it's probably um, another topic for another time, but I don't think it one goes without the other completely, but okay. <laughs> Somebody else? So, two things. Uh, one is that, uh, that you know that uh, Hungary during the planned economy was, uh, was said uh, the country of iron and steel. So the, the, the steel was extremely cheap, uh, of course, not, uh, so uh, artificially uh, was cheap. The other thing is that, that shell structures originally was invited uh, because of its extremely few uh, iron uh, work uh, on this enormous, enormous uh, uh, lungs, uh, how to say. So uh, maybe uh, they are the best. Uh, they, uh, originally, it was thought that the, uh, these are the, the perfect solution of making large uh, uh, lungs uh, with uh, very uh, uh, few iron. Um, I'm afraid uh, here again the legend and the, and the reality is somewhat mixed because uh, the truth is that if you um, so there is no reinforced concrete without steel. And it's really, it's really a harsh question because, and it can be explained not by Hungarian example, but by Neri, because uh, steel was actually banned before World War II in Italy uh, for some national socialist, some kind of idea. It was, it was not produced in Italy, so it was said an Italian and they couldn't use it. And that was the time when Neri invented ferro cement uh, which is a strange thing because you need uh, steel there also, but so much uh, lighter wires that somehow he managed. So it shows that in order to be, build, to be able to build reinforced concrete structure, you indeed need steel and not a few. You need a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, more and more reinforced uh, concrete without steel because carbon fibers and different yes. things, but not at that time. Uh, you were somebody else? 